Hey everyone, this is Eve Picker. And if you listen to this podcast series, you're going to learn how to make some change. Thanks so much for joining us on this podcast. I'm Eve Picker and my life revolves around cities, real estate, crowdfunding and change. In this podcast series, we'll be digging deep to discover how we can build better cities by building better buildings. Today's feisty guest is Kimber Lanning. Kimber is dedicated to making Arizona a world-class destination and is fiercely proud of the culture of the region. Specifically, Kimber hates injustice. She wants to leave Arizona a better and more just place than she found it. To this end, Kimber founded both Local First Arizona and Local First Arizona Foundation, two statewide organizations that work together to strengthen Arizona's economy. She's grown Local First Arizona into an organization with five statewide offices and 28 employees who work on a diverse array of programs ranging from healthy local food access, entrepreneurial development in underserved communities, and rural community development, each of which plays a part in building sustainable and resilient local economies. And if that's not enough, Kimber opened Stinkweeds, a record store, when she was just 19 years old and has moved the store four times over the past 27 years. If you want to know more about Kimber after you've listened to this podcast, please visit evepicker.com where you'll find links and other goodies on the show notes page and where you can subscribe to my newsletter on all things real estate impact. So hello, Kimba. How are you? I'm doing very well this morning, Eve. How are you? Good, good. So I would love you to tell us a little about what you've built in Arizona to support your passion. Absolutely. So my background is a small business owner. So I've had a small business for 32 years now here in Phoenix. It's a music store of all things. And I started Local First in 2003 Initially, my orientation was simply corporate versus local. I wanted to build a better economy by educating and informing people about why the local the economy matters and why local businesses matter. But it, it, we've really been an organization that has evolved over time. And so today we look very different than when we started. We do have the business coalition that I originally envisioned which is now 3,600 businesses strong, small, medium, and large. But in addition, we run some very specific programs that are creating a more diverse and inclusive economy. So the first one is we run a business accelerator program called Fuerza Local, which is Spanish for essentially Stronger Together Local First. And it's a, a business accelerator program that we teach in Spanish that helps community members not only build successful businesses, but to become bankable, to gain a credit score so they can access capital at fair market rates and essentially pulling them out of the predatory lenders. We also run a sustainability department, which is focused on a green business certification program. We run a program called Forum that I think you'd be very interested in that's focused on helping the development community sort of wrap their arms around the social determinants of health and better understand health equity and how the built environment plays a role in that. And then the final two programs are uh, food and farming. We do a lot to build healthier food systems in Arizona. And then finally, uh, we are the Rural Development Council for the state. So we have five statewide offices and we work diligently in communities of all sizes to help them create entrepreneurial ecosystems and build opportunities for all. So that's us in a nutshell. There's a lot going on. (laughs) You've built quite an organization. I know you have like 17 employees and four different uh, today, we, Yeah, we actually even have grown bigger than that. We're at 28 today. Yeah, it's been a, quite a remarkable run. And, and the good news is, is I'm still as fired up as ever. So who knows what else will happen in the next 10 years. Great. That's really great news. So tell us just a little bit about your favorite project at the moment that you're working on. 
Well, you know what? I'm going to frame it a little bit differently than favorite because it's the hardest work I've ever done. And it's in an area in Phoenix called South Phoenix. And like many big cities, this is a part of town that was very racially segregated. The very much white power control of the city here sort of relegated uh, people of color into this area that is south of the river bottom. And, And this is a story that can probably resonate in many cities across America. In the river bottom, we used it as a dump and there's all sorts of toxic sludge in there. And just recently, the city won funding through a federal grant to expand the light rail into South Phoenix, which on the one hand is absolutely fantastic. We want these folks that live here to be able to access high quality public transportation and it will minimize air pollution and all the other benefits that come with that. But I happen to live in a city that doesn't have a lot of power in terms of, or I I should say they do have the power, but they're refusing to use their power to create zoning regulations that will minimize displacement. So while the community is supportive of the light rail, they're very opposed and fearful of the gentrification that comes with light rail when there's no transit justice involved. And clearly, rightfully so. I mean, many of them feel like this is the third time you've come for my family to move us out of here. So I'm very much involved with a business assistance plan to try to strengthen and shore up the businesses that are there. And I'm very active in trying to help those businesses figure out how to buy their own buildings. Because as you know, when wealth moves in, you know, ownership matters. And we need to make sure that as many families that have lived there for a long time own their properties as we possibly can. So that's a big project I'm working on right now. I I wouldn't describe it as my favorite, but it's the most challenging thing I've done in my career. Yeah, that's very challenging. And what sort of success are you having in helping these business owners purchase the buildings? So far, we've only been able to help one, and that's just very honest. There's many different facets here. We've had more than one that could qualify, but they don't trust banks enough. And so they wouldn't go for the loan. They want to do a cash deal and they're struggling to find ways to make that happen. Um, There's a lot of situations where we've actually found people that believe they were purchasing a building, but when they were making their payments, the landlord had actually never sold them the building. He was just collecting the payments um, so there's quite a lot of, yeah, there's quite a lot of, you know, unlawful activity in terms of abuse and victimization of people who don't know the laws. Yeah, but we do have one success story and he, he actually owned his building and he was able to acquire a, a parking lot that he was using that he had never owned before. So we have a long way to go. Um, I'm looking at models, community land trusts and other such things. And you and I talked about crowdfunding, trying to figure out a way to make that work in a community that doesn't have a lot of collaboration um, and certainly a lot of historical trauma that causes justified mistrust. Be sure to go to evepicker.com and sign up for my free educational newsletter about impact real estate investing you'll be among the first to hear about new projects you can invest in. That's evepicker.com. Thanks so much. Yes, that's a pretty painful story. The person who purchased the land, can that person help reach others who might be mistrustful? Yes, we're doing a lot of work to get the word out about that. Um, We actually have uh, submitted thief to the uh, attorney general's office. And we're seeing what legal recourse there might be. So that's in progress. Wow. That's really quite a project. So your world does really intersect with real estate quite a lot. And do you think that crowdfunding could help or do you think that would just be more difficult for these people like this? No, I believe it would help. The, the challenge is you know, there's language barriers. This is a a Spanish preferred part of town. And then there's, there's certainly trust. You know, one thing that I find quite interesting in, in our business accelerator program, which I mentioned called Fuerza Local, the way we help people earn a credit score 
is that they participate in what's called a money pool. In places around the world, it's called a tanda or or a kundina. Um, it's used. It's been used for centuries around the world. And, and the way I describe it to people, largely those of us in privilege who have never faced these kinds of situations, it's a way that families have saved money without paying interest by leveraging friends and family. So let's just say my car broke down and I need $1,200 by tomorrow to get it fixed or I face losing my job because it's the only transportation that I have. I would call 12, well, 11 friends and family together, and I would ask them each to put $100 into a kitty. And then if you can imagine like going around uh, the clock on a, on a dial, each of us would put $100 into the kitty in the center each month, and a different person in my family would get to take the whole kitty each month. So I would take first position and take the whole 1200 My aunt's getting married next month. She'll take the next 1200 And we would all continue to pay for the year $100 a month. So we've digitized that through a, a program called eMoney Pool, and we put our students, our classes of business owners, into pods of 12, and they're very familiar with a Tanda. And so we don't have to teach them what a Tanda is. We have to teach them to trust the digital aspect of it, but they'll put their money in, and we're reporting those payments over six months to Experion. So that when they graduate, experience on the credit bureau, they have an actual credit history and we have relationships with two credit unions that will accept that six month payment history in lieu of any either bad credit or no credit history to extend them a line of credit for their business. So with crowdfunding, the, the, the challenge is not that I don't think it would be helpful. The challenge is how do we build trust? When we first started Fuez de Local, the, first, the hardest part was recruiting those first 12 businesses. Sure. They had to trust us. They had to believe it was going to work, that it mattered, that a credit score mattered. All of those things, even that access to capital mattered, right? They were so used to just doing business on a cash basis and not buying what they couldn't afford, even if it meant inventory that they then couldn't sell. You know, it, it, they were hindered significantly in their businesses. So with, with crowdfunding, it's a matter of how do we get in there and show them that this works. Now that we're going, you know, we have about 60 students each semester that we can afford to put through the program, but over 150 apply. Now that the word is out that we're a trustworthy organization, that this works, that credit works, that banks are not going to steal all your money, all of those rampant rumors are not true and that we can actually be a provided and trusted resource. So I think if we can get over that hurdle, Eve, the crowdfunding for real estate will be huge. Yeah. So I, I also wonder, although, you know, it doesn't sound like you have great neighbors there who are helping. I wonder if there are people across the nation who might contribute to a fund that mm -hmm. a trustworthy group like yourself could control. Right. I'd be interested in having that conversation. I think that this is a classic case of a very deliberately marginalized community, you know, that's not being listened to and that very much needs support. And I, I think that if we could get that story out, people would res it would resonate because whether we're talking about is Chicago or, or certainly communities like New Orleans and others where the recovery has been slow, the investment has been slow, and people have have been, you know, essentially left on their own. And, and now we're coming to take their land, essentially. And this is how this, the, this system works. And we need to stop it. Wow, it's quite a story. So when you talk about this, I, I can't even really think about the buildings. For you, impact is all really all about the people, right? It's all about the people. And this particular place, the one thing we have going is that the real estate was all developed in the 30s, 40s, 50s. So there's a lot of very small footprint buildings that are stacked up very close to one another with unique ownership. Um, some of them might, might have, you know, five or six buildings in one parcel. But my, my point is, it will be harder for developers to do massive land acquisitions because there's so many deals that need to be done. And that will perhaps save some of the older buildings so that we can keep local and independent businesses in them. 
Interesting. So have you thought about recreating like a new buildings or new set of buildings like this as well? Have you thought about actually finding some land on this corridor and doing a project? I, I gather you're a nonprofit, so that could be helpful. I love that idea. I don't know how to make that work. But what's interesting is the city of Phoenix owns a lot of land in this area. So I'm, I'm very curious about getting involved in an RFP process that is putting in, for example, not just commercial space, but affordable housing with local businesses on the ground floor. I'm really intrigued by this new model um, that I found in Portland that you may be familiar with, where a nonprofit went in, bought affordable housing, refurbished it, and then have allowed themselves to be bought out of it as the community members that live there have bought into it. And residents run businesses on the ground floor, and it's a a very healthy and active development. And I'm, I'm very interested in that model as well. Yeah, I mean, it's it really interesting to see if it would translate, but it sounds like you need to move pretty fast if that train is coming, right? <laughs> That's exactly right. We, That's we have right. to move fast and the pressure is intense. Right. So are there any other current trends in real estate development that you think could be helpful to you in that area? You know, you see, for example, a lot of sort of market restaurant trends, which allow small businesses to start in a... Uh, curated, I don't uh, like incubated space, co working which shares office space. I mean, right. there are right. people I'm talking to who are building, I don't want to even call them co working spaces, but small, inc- almost like an inc- incubator space. Yeah. yeah, incubator space, but for, for hands on businesses, not tech companies. Um, <laughs> right. Like that, right. Know. Yeah. Yes. So that's a project that we run in a town called Mesa, which is in the East Valley here of the greater Phoenix area. We partnered with community development partners. Uh, They're real estate developers who are very interested in place-based development. So this is an affordable housing complex. Everyone there is qualified living below the poverty line. So it's very affordable. It's a new market tax credit deal that's right on the light rail line. And they've partnered with us to run a commercial kitchen on site. So we teach our Fuerza Local classes there. And they invested in a commercial kitchen, which we never would have been able to afford. But we're programming it in ways that are beneficial to their residents. So we teach nutrition cooking classes for kids and adults. We have 29 gardening beds so that families can grow their own food site. There's shared fun playground area with barbecues uh, so that families can have indoor outdoor opportunities and really build community there. And so, and we're also incubating small businesses. So some of the residents as well as other people in the neighborhood are growing catering companies or um, foods that they can sell at the farmer's market, which is just down the road. Uh, So there's a variety of food related things happening. And we just started a business accelerator boot camp that is designed specifically for food entrepreneurs. So when they get out of the the sort of broad business development, they can go through six courses that are, you know, on managing food costs and mitigating food waste and and very specific to restaurants. So so you really part, like you're digging in and helping these people build <laughs> businesses and learn how to build businesses. And then the last piece of it is the real estate. And when they find something affordable, it, when gentrification comes, it all kind of falls apart. So ownership becomes really critical, doesn't it? It does. It really does. And, and the other piece of that, Eve, is that we what we're trying to do is demonstrate a model that we can encourage the city of Phoenix to include in their RFP. So when they put out an RFP for a city-owned parcel, they could be requiring a ground floor commercial kitchen specifically to incubate food entrepreneurs. They could require on-site gardening beds. So we're trying to use that as a model and then apply pressure to the city on certain parcels, not all of them, obviously, but certain parcels that we think are important for maintaining affordability and health equity, we we would make that requirement. And so we've done tours of this property to show the city officials how this is different and why it matters. Wow. So in the world of real estate impact, 
and real estate impact investing, how do you think it might be improved? For impact investing, I feel that, you know, I I see some impact investing that is focused on systems change and some that's focused on projects that perhaps are temporary fixes. As good as they are, absent that particular project, it hasn't really implemented long-term change. And I think that this is the the million-dollar question. We have so much inequity in the U.S. There are really great people with a lot of money trying to find ways to invest it. Again, we, we're going to have to to rattle some cages here. And I'm not picking on any particular organization, but let's just say you have a giant, some of these giant nonprofit organizations that might be working with kids in communities of color, as an example. We can, of course, invest in those communities and we can demonstrate that um, with the proper education, more of them will be successful But what are we really doing to change the racism that put the system in place that marginalized them in the first place and limits their ownership? We shouldn't be focusing on the few success stories. We should be focusing on the equity that enables everyone to have an equal opportunity to succeed. So that's my point. You know, what what, what we're doing essentially with a lot of philanthropic money in America is we're buying more pool tables to placate the time of the children who are suffering through the indignities of a racist system. And that is unconscionable. So how do we start to fix that? Well, I think we need to have an honest conversation around race. And I think that many white people that are doing well in this country are very slow, if not opposed to recognizing the privilege that got them there. But we need to get there before we can start coming up with um, actual solutions. Because in order to create equity, we need to be willing to give some things up. Yes. Yeah, it's a very, very difficult conversation. And I think very hard for people to hear each other. Mm -hmm. I think maybe that's the first step, just getting them to listen to each other. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of pain. It's escalating. If anybody's not recognizing that it's escalating right now. Um, oh, it they, is they, escalating. Yeah, I agree. It's, uh, yeah. it's escalating very quickly. So I don't know if we're going to solve that here today, <laughs> Kim. <Kimba. laughs> we're definitely <laughs> not going to solve it here today. At least we're talking about it, right? I think it's it's the first step. We have to talk about it. And um, it, it really, you know, when, when you start talking about real estate and equity. And another thing I just would like to touch on is that the financial systems in the United States are very rapidly alienating communities of color as well. So when you look at the redlining or, or specifically, you know, the big banks not lending in communities that are primarily people of color, then we have to hold ourselves accountable as the people who have deposits that we move our money into places where those deposits will best help support those communities. So that may look like community banks or credit unions or certainly banks that are owned by people of color. So what I've done is I've moved all of my money into banks that I can see are demonstrating in the communities that I want to preserve and support and uplift And so we can't simply scratch our heads and say, well, look at all this inequity. If our money is sitting in Bank of America or Wells Fargo or J.P. Morgan Chase, we need to acknowledge that our money is doing harm. It's invested in private prisons. It's invested in perpetuating the inequities that we see in this country. So that would just be one thing that I would ask your listeners to consider is to move their money into smaller locally owned community banks or credit unions where they can be accountable for their money. I think it's a great first step, a really great first step. Mm -hmm. Let's move on. It's hard to know where to move on after this conversation. It's a pretty big (laughs) conversation, yeah. So how, how do you think we... We need to think about our cities and neighborhoods to build better places for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that we need to always be willing to what, you know, the, the phase that I call peeling back the layers of the onion. So, you know, a typical analysis might go in and say, you know, this neighborhood is underemployed. You know, there's a high percentage of unemployed as well as people that are working part time or not Uh, maximizing their education, whatever that might look like. 
But sometimes there's an indicator that we completely overlook, like lack of affordable childcare. So when I talk about building uh, great communities, we need to look at all aspects because when you don't have affordable quality childcare, you are taking a parent out of the workforce or putting them in a part-time position or, or whatever that might be just to try to you know, be the, the supportive parent that they need to be. And so um, when, especially when we work in rural areas, every worker counts in some of these smaller towns. And so you know, when we go in and do an assessment, sometimes you know, they're surprised to hear that the problem is not workforce training. It's not, you know, well, these people just don't want to work, which I've heard. <laughs> it's that you need to invest in quality childcare in order to maximize the workers that are there. Believe me, they would love the opportunity, but they don't currently have it. So peeling back the layers of the onion is, is, is really important as we begin to think about how to build better places. Yeah, I agree. So we were, I was somewhere yesterday where the city's working on a rather large project and they were talking about a work, a prison release center nearby and people drifting over to a McDonald's and sort of hanging out there and causing all sorts of problems. And, you know, the discussion we had, well, well, was it, you know, that they're basically using McDonald's as a safe place to hang out. There, there isn't anywhere else for them to go. They, they don't have money. They don't have a job. So perhaps looking at what the work release center provides is the first step, not, you know, not tearing down the McDonald's, right? Exactly right. That's exactly, a, that's a perfect example for um, what I say, peeling back the layers of the onion to look at what are the original causes? What, what are we dealing with before we react? That's right. So, yeah, no, I totally agree with that. So, you know, you're, you've worked a lot in community, community work, and I'm wondering what community engagement tools you've seen that have worked best, because clearly that's a big struggle. Mm -hmm. People to the table. So I'm going to answer that in a few different ways. In, in rural communities, it's about convening people talking to them and really listening to what their needs are so that you can accurately assess what the challenges are. I think that in the Latino community where we're working, you don't need to convene them all in a room. You need to find a few champions and let those champions tell the story and it will reverberate. I guess the first step is knowing your audience, knowing the community where you're working before you implement any sort of strategy. You know, in, in rural communities here in Arizona, the, the opioid crisis has spread out into the rural areas, so much so that we have private sector employers who will put out a, an entry-level position at, say, $35,000 a year, uh, which in rural Arizona is a good, is a good wage for, for living and uh, for an entry-level position. And they'll say if they get five, if they get ten applicants, that five of them won't pass a drug test. Oh, wow. and of the remaining five, uh, three of them, on average, will no show the interview. Oh. And of the two that actually show up, if they just hire them because they showed up, essentially, the average length of time they can keep them is six months. Wow. So this is a massive workforce crisis. And I don't think that our rural communities are, are an exception. There's a, a major problem uh, just under the surface in the U.S. Um, that's workforce related. You know, and, and you're starting to see more and more people uh, starting to say, wait, we need more people in the trades. Well, for 20 years, young people were told if you don't go get a four-year degree, you basically should move into the alley and become a heroin addict, right? Oh. And so everybody ran and got a four-year degree, and now we don't have people to hang drywall. And it's important that we recognize we need people in the trades. Not everyone is going to have a four-year oh, degree. Oh, I so agree with you. I so mm -hmm. agree with you. So you're going to start a trade school next? <laughs> you know, don't get me started. <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I have to tell you, both my children went to trade school, and they they were oh, not ready. They were not ready for uh, college, and it, they both love learning. And they both said it was the best educational experience they had. They loved it. So, yeah, uh, my um, I have a dear friend whose son knew in high school he wanted to be a welder, so he went to one of the um, 
a trade school uh, for the last year of high school, got out of that and landed a job at, you know, $45,000 a year as a welder that he, he absolutely loves. And he's doing better than any of his friends who are struggling through community college and everything else. So, so the I interesting think that- thing was that when my kids were finishing high school, there wasn't one counselor who would talk to us about trade schools. Right. Yeah. No, it's, it is a huge bias and it's going to cost our country mightily. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Mm-hmm. Not everyone is cut out for college and not everyone learns very much in college. And I think the next the next step of the problem is the debt they're burdened with. I've I've hired people with liberal arts degrees who can't write a letter and I really wonder how they're ever going to pay back their college debt. Right. It, it's a crisis. <laughs> it's a crisis. And, and then that doesn't even touch on the fact that there's not enough of those jobs to go around. Meanwhile, the jobs that actually require hands-on knowledge are, are available. I mean, I can't find a roofer in this city to save my life right now. They are spread too thin because there's not enough of them. Wow. You know, one thing I do want to mention um, that I think that people would be curious to hear about is we have one small town here that's 1,300 people. And they suddenly realize that everyone in their town that knew how to be a plumber, an air conditioning repairman, or a heavy equipment operator was over 65 and just, you know, moments away from retirement. So they started a journeyman program where they took six high school juniors and seniors. And for a year, uh, I think it was actually 18 months, they shadowed in the field these professionals so that by the time the older gentlemen were ready to retire, the younger gentlemen were ready to step into those roles. And it was very successful. So it's like an apprentice program, right? It is. Yeah. 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 That's that's fabulous. Well, we're straying from uh, real estate impact, but it's very interesting. <laughs> um, so <laughs> well, but yes and no, we can't we can't develop what we need to develop without the trades. So to me, true, it's true. So I'm going to challenge you to ta- start that <laughs> trade school. It sounds like an opportunity in the making. <laughs> <laughs> Probably won't forgive me for that. So, okay. Well, then I have one wrap-up question. Actually, one wrap-up and then three others that I'd like to ask you. So, four questions. (laughs) Well, where where do you think the future of real estate impact investing lies, knowing what we know today and the gaps that exist? Uh, Yeah, I think it has to lie in uh, community land trust. I I think that we, we can't retain ownership as impact investors in communities that need that ownership. So the Portland model that I mentioned, I think the the original acquisition, whether that's done by a group of individuals or nonprofits, I think they need to allow themselves to be bought out of it by the people who live there so that it becomes a self-reliant entity. So that sounds like what you're going to be working on next, right? That's right. That's right. Very good. And I have three sign-off questions for you. So what's the key factor or what are the key factors that make a real estate project impactful to you? I think it has to be acculturated, meaning in the community where you are building, it has to be responsive to that community. El Rancho is 90% Latino and it's uh, responsive to that in that the programming is done in Spanish. The the foods that are encouraged and uh, the equipment even that we installed was, you know, for people that are going to be making foods like tamales and other foods that community uh, enjoys. I also think and the that... Rest of us, and the rest of us enjoy <laughs> Well, the rest of us enjoy, but, uh, you know, grandma that lives there knows how to make the best ones known to mankind, you know, so it's important that the younger kids be able to learn those heritage foods and, tra- and traditions. And so providing a space for them to, to convene and share is, is important. I also think the shared space for the kids to play after school and, um, you know, the barbecues outdoors are, are very acculturated as well. Another thing I will say in real estate, uh, Latino t- families tend to be larger. So this is an affordable housing complex that has two, three, and four bedroom, which you rarely see in affordability. It's usually one and two bedrooms only because they always say it can't be done, but it can be done and it must be done. Uh, so I think place-based would be my uh, my first one and uh, culturally appropriate for the communities that are living there. 
I mean, then the third, that it be comprehensive and holistic. We need to think about health very broadly. Are there opportunities for the residents to um, learn new skills or advance themselves economically on site? Are there after school programs for the kids to continue their learning after school? Those questions need to be answered. Very good. And so other other than by raising money, in what ways can involving investors through crowdfunding benefit the impact real estate developer? Outside of raising money? I think influence, yeah. uh, just influence. I think um, there are a lot of impact investors that are influencing others' behavior and perhaps they're not even aware. But I think to, uh, to shine a light, to share, to show what an impact investment they've made has done, to share those stories, I think is important. Okay. And then this is my really big one that I have to ask everyone. How do you think real estate development in the U.S. can be improved? Oh my goodness. Um, that. <laughs> That's a whole podcast, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, where the developers have ruled the earth like the dinosaurs for my entire lifetime. So they control the policies. They control our state legislature. If they don't want to build sustainably, they don't have to because they'll just go and fight the laws and they always win. They're a powerful bunch. So... For me, I I think that what I would ask is that they actually are accountable for the outcomes of what they develop. So that means that they are accountable for the displacement, that they are accountable for the environmental degradation, that they are accountable for the affordability or their role in, in crisis. I think too often developers have been trained to build what they want and they drop property, you know, they drop new developments in like spaceships from outer space without even looking around at what was actually needed. Too often they just replicate what they've done that's been profitable for themselves rather than considering the rest of us who have to live with the crap they turn out. Understanding walkability, you know, dropping in an apartment complex that doesn't have any ground floor activation in a, in a, in a walkable district is, is a crime and, it, it, you know, they need to be held accountable for that. I could go on. I mean, I've seen some that's really pretty good. But, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's, um, good that's <laughs> yeah, that's really holding people accountable. Well, I've really enjoyed talking to you, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. And thank I'm sure you. we'll be talking again soon because I really want to talk to you about crowdfunding in your community. I think there's something we could cook up together. I'm sure. I think so too. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having thank me. Thank you, Kimba. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. That was Kimber Lanning. I really enjoyed talking to her. Kimber gave me three great takeaways. First, the odds are stacked against small businesses. They are not bankable. Second, she's working to stop displacement that she expects will happen with a new light rail in a racially segregated section of South Phoenix. And third, women should rule the world. What did you learn? You can read more about Kimber on the show notes page for this podcast at evepicker.com. While you're there, please consider signing up for my newsletter to find out more about how to make money in real estate while making some change. Thank you so much for spending your time with Kimber and I today. We'll talk again soon, but for now, this is Eve Picker signing off to go make some change.